<laughs> God, send me anywhere. Only go with me. Lay any burden on me. Only sustain me. And sever any tie in my heart, except the tie that binds my heart to yours. If you have men who will only come if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. I will go anywhere, provided it is forward. David Livingston. Thank you. Well, this uh, road that we're going to be taking for today's talk, I think we'll be going forward into the realm of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> um, the mystery of the Sphinx, which is such, um, you know, an enigmatic being, creature um, for any of us to contemplate. And we're very fortunate that Kurt Green-Dean, one of our frequent presenters, fortunately, uh, for us at Stella Moving Center at Gems from the Wisdom Traditions, a conversation circle, such as we're having today, that um, Kirk Redeen is the one to be um, leading us in this conversation. He um, is an architect himself. He has um, studied um, many of the world's um, traditions of, of temple building, which I think is really interesting in regard to this topic. And um, he has looked into the topic from the Hindu perspective, and he's going to stay, um, at least at the beginning, uh, more in the Greek and Egyptian um, perspectives, because the Sphinx is a symbol that reaches across a number of, of different cultures. And um, so I'm going to let Kirk dive into it right away. Would Thank Kirk. you. Oh, um, can you make me a co-host, Renee, so I can share my screen? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in today. Hey, Kurt. Uh, yes, we're we're going forward, and we're also going back in time, of course. Yeah. One of the very oldest uh, wonders of the world. So this is a a topic uh, that really lends itself to imagery. Uh, as you'll see, um, the Sphinx that uh, most of us probably think of when we hear the word is this huge limestone figure call, carved out of the living bedrock of the Giza Plateau, uh, just outside of present-day Cairo. As the oldest and most intact of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it silently waits and watches, wide-eyed and alert like an immortal guardian of ancient sacred mysteries. Aligned with all the nine pyramids of the Giza Plateau, it faces due east, gazing towards that point on the horizon where the rising sun marks the vernal equinox. It's 240 feet long. It's about the size of a 747 airplane in length, 66 feet high, and 61 feet wide at the base. The, uh, the sculpted uh, figure or body of the Sphinx, as we know, is that of a recumbent lion with the head of a man who wears a pharaoh's headdress. And even in its defaced and weathered condition, it draws millions of tourists each year, many who speak of its powerful presence, hypnotic majesty, and radiant monolithic grandeur. But why is the symbol of the man-lion common to so many sacred wisdom traditions, as Rene mentioned? The word lion is derived from the Greek leon and seems from the first to have been linked with the uh, zodiacal constellation of Leo as a symbol of fearless and divine self-mastery the heroic guardian of the clan, as the lion is. As the king of beasts, the lion represented uh, wise and powerful control over all the forces, forces of untamed nature. 
And in uh, Babylonian culture, the lion was both a zodiacal symbol of kingship and of eternal vigilance um, and one of protection and guardianship. Upon approaching the temple entrance, one would be greeted by a pair of 12 foot tall lamasu, the winged and five legged man lion who function as both the temple guardian and inter intermediary for the god housed within. The Persian and Greek sphinxes no doubt held similar associations while the Christian winged lion appears in the vision of Ezekiel, one of four winged wheels, all covered with eyes, as is mentioned in the quote here, uh, displaying aspects of the all-seeing glory and majesty of God. The Sanskrit, Sanskrit word for lion is simha, and in the Hindu tradition, Nara Simha is the man lion, the fourth avatar of Vishnu, the sustainer and restorer of righteousness, and the god of yoga, who transcends time and death, and who serves all living beings with true justice, through the destruction and transcendence of all selfish or self-seeking limitations and partialities. The symbol of the lion is also central to Buddhist iconography as well, uh, from the first being associated with the teaching of the historical Buddha, whose lion roar, quote unquote, established the Dharma and the Sangha on earth, uh, while nourishing and sustaining all beings in all three worlds. And this uh, four-sided uh, lion figure is from the, uh, the lion gates at uh, the stupa at Sanchi, which is one of the oldest stupas. I think it's actually the oldest uh, extant stupa in India. And in Tibetan Buddhism, the snow lion is a symbol of the sacred land of Tibet itself, uh, blessed by the sacrificial presence of compassionate bodhisattvas who preserve and protect the Dharma on behalf of all sentient beings and it is also a symbol for the lineage of the Dalai Lamas. Based on carbon dating of um, pieces of uh, tree uh, lodged in the um, mortar joints of the Great Pyramid, uh, the Great Sphinx at Giza is believed by many contemporary Egyptologists to have been built around the same time as the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, during the rule of the Pharaoh Khephren, just under 5,000 years ago. However, there are more than a few archaeologists and geologists who are convinced that it is far older. As first pointed out by the French Egyptologist and mathematician Schwaller de Lubiz, uh, both the main body of the Sphinx and the surrounding walls, as we're seeing them here, display a form of weathering that could only have been accomplished by long periods of extreme rainfall. Such a climate has not occurred in Egypt less than 10,000 years ago, towards the end of the last ice age. But accepting such a date for construction of the Sphinx, when humanity was supposedly still hunting and gathering with only crude stone tools uh, or as implements, um, would overthrow all the mainstream accepted chronologies of the history of civilization, at least in, on the Egyptian continent, and force a drastic reevaluation of human cultural evolution. So you will find uh, contemporary Egyptologists just simply saying, well, it's impossible that, that it could be that old, despite the evidence. The word Sphinx is uh, thought to be derived from the uh, Egyptian uh, term Seshep Ankh Atun, or Seshep. For, for short, 
uh, which is the the um, the man the one of the one of the terms that the Egyptians used to refer to the Sphinx. And uh, this is a compound term or compound name with many layers of meaning, typically translated as the living image of Atum. And Atum was the self-created sun god, the first and original deity of the Egyptian pantheon, um, from whom all other gods, humans, and living creatures descended. In uh, one hieroglyphic account, a tomb emerges from an egg out of the waters of the deep and then wears a sun disk on his head encircled with a cobra or serpent, as you see here on the right. And in this case, we have the, the head of a, a falcon uh, rather than a lion. But nonetheless, uh, this is the kind of crossover and differentiation that you get through different phases of uh, Egyptian history. And sometimes in the same temple, you'll get different representations of the same God and certainly having having a meaning associated with that difference of representation, but mostly not very well understood uh, by Egyptologists. And the great Sphinx did, uh, as we mentioned, wore what's called a Neem's headdress. And the remains of the cobra, which once sat uh, perched on its forehead, can still be seen. And although the, the snake or the serpent is sometimes seen as a symbol of evil in Christianity due to its uh, supposed role as tempter in the Garden of Eden, Eden um, in Egypt and many other world mythologies, the serpent is a symbol of the highest form of divine wisdom, immortality, and eternity. And we do have that. Uh, uh, saying attributed to Jesus that in the Gospel of Matthew that uh, be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The Sphinx was also known to the Egyptians by another name, Hor M Haket, or meaning Horus on the or in the horizon. And Horus was another form of Atum Ra, uh, the sun god mentioned, uh, depicted often, as we mentioned, with a, uh, or sometimes depicted with the head of a falcon, apparently associated with his function of bestowing spiritual freedom and seership, uh, the, the, um, the incredible capacity of sight that such birds possess, and also of flight. Um, and Ra was also known as the lion god of the awesome eye. So the eye of Ra is that is thought to be that of esoteric knowledge and prophecy, uh, that visionary capacity which sees all and knows all, which penetrates all the veils of nature and gazes into the essence and hidden nature of things. And this uh, little bit of hieroglyphic that we're seeing here is thought to be a symbol of initiation where Horus, as a kind of semi-divine personage, or you could say an enlightened teacher, is passing on uh, a form of wisdom through initiation to uh, the aspirant or student in this case, who's also wearing the, the crown of a pharaoh. So it was a, a kind of divine kingship being bestowed. And this is from uh, Salim Hassan, who is uh, a well-known uh, Egyptologist. Egyptians believed that in the beginning, their land was ruled by a dynasty of great gods, of whom Horus, the son of Isis and Osiris, was the last. He was succeeded by a dynasty of semi-divine beings known as the followers of Horus, who in turn gave place to the historical kings of Egypt. And uh, many of you probably know that uh, both the ancient Greeks and Romans, uh, for them, Egypt was the repository of the most ancient forms of wisdom. Both Plato and Pythagoras, as well as many other Greek sages are said to have spent years of their prime 
uh, learning and being initiated by the hierophants of ancient Egypt. And in the Edfu building texts, uh, as translated and described by scholars such as uh, A. E. Raymond, the followers of Horus were those led by, quote, the seven sages, unquote, a kind of brotherhood of enlightened beings, also called uh, the builder gods and the lords of light, uh, Christ-like initiates who bridged the deluge and preserved the wisdom of those civilizations which are thought to have preceded what is known as dynastic or uh, pharaonic Egypt. And um, it was their mission, according to these texts, to to lay the first foundation stones of a new civilization uh, to guide and teach humanity the, uh, these foundational universal truths, which, were, uh, which would animate all the arts and sciences, including that of architecture and astronomy. And both of these uh, disciplines were considered esoteric. That is, they were not shared with the general public. Uh, because of their powerful sacred dimensions and, and possibilities for misuse. And um, this is perhaps why scholars have not yet found hieroglyphics describing the design or construction of temples or pyramids. Um, so that's why, the, and why there's so many mysteries associated, especially with the, the most ancient temples uh, of Egypt. And the Edfu myth um, also, as you may have uh, recognized, bears a striking resemblance to the stories of the biblical flood and the Christian Noah, as well as uh, similar stories found in Hindu Hinduism, uh, where the seven rishis are guided over the waters by the Matsya avatar, this is a very wise uh, uh, being or, or force of wisdom. And... Um, so the question arises that is the Sphinx then in one of its layers of symbolism uh, representing this uh, kind of golden age of a higher and more advanced civilization that's now hidden uh, in the sands of time? About 500 miles south of Giza at the temple to Hathor at Dendera is a round zodiacal map which was carved into the ceiling. And according to H.P. Blavatsky, it's similar to one that she saw in a temple in northern India. And among many other remarkable features, she says, is that it records three precessional cycles of the equinoxes, uh, each of which is 25,000 years long. And uh, while so while modern modern science um, claims that the knowledge of the zodiac originated in Babylonia in the third millennium BC, um, this feature of the the Dendera zodiac would indicate that Egypt possessed astronomical records extending back at least seventy eight thousand years. Now, how would that be possible? Because um, that's that's a very sophisticated form of science and of, of exact observation and measurement of the skies and of uh, time cycles. So um, the other um, uh, feature of the, of the Giza Plateau is that no inscriptions have ever been found um, identifying these pyramids as burial sites and no burial remains have ever been discovered. And yet you find this the standard line, uh, you know, if you go online and look at Encyclopedia Britannica, it tells you that these were tombs of the pharaohs. It's kind of egomaniacal, you know, enormous constructions just to house their remains. But there's no there's no real indication that that's the case. So it's very interesting. Um, So we're going to move on to uh, the Greek Sphinx now, and uh, there's the theme of the pyramid comes up uh, uh, a couple of months from now, I believe, uh, in the gems tradition. So hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss that further at that point. But in Greek iconography, the, the Sphinx makes its appearance in several contexts. Um, here it is a female rather than a male. 
uh, who is not only a guardian and inter intermediary of the temple, but she is also a guardian and guide through after death states, uh, a kind of uh, mother to the soul uh, of the deceased. And um, this particular Sphinx stood atop a freestanding pillar at Delphi, um, as you can see here in a kind of reconstruction. Delphi was one of the most famed centers of ancient Gre Greece of healing and of oracular wisdom in the ancient Greek world where um, people would travel for um, weeks and months sometimes from all over the ancient world to visit there to, to seek um, um, the words of the, uh, the, um, the, the Python of Apollo uh, kind of uh, oracle and also to seek different forms of healing. And there's some remarkable stories that could be told about that, which we're not going into today. Um, and like these depictions in the Greek myth of Oedipus, the Sphinx is a composite creature, part female, part lion, and part eagle with the tail of a serpent. And in the, uh, the myth of Oedipus, she confronts all travelers on the road to Thebes. A generous reward awaits anyone who can answer her riddle correctly. The riddle is, what is that unitary thing that is at the same time a biped, a tripod, and a quadruped. And while, while many were perplexed and thus devoured by the Sphinx, according to the myth, uh, Oedipus had what seemed like a correct answer. Um, he declared that the creature described in the riddle was a man. Whoops, sorry. Oh. These last two slides have uh, have an automatic uh, timer on them that's taken them off the screen. But I'll, so, uh oh, here I'm going to have to stop this. <laughs> this is a whole other <laughs> story here. Let's do this. Yeah. So this is where we are. Um, so Oedipus uh, gave what seemed like a very clever answer uh, that it was man because uh, the creature. Uh, that because uh, as an infant, uh, a human being is a quadruped, right? Crawling on all fours. When grown, he's a biped. And in old age, he's a tripod using uh, a cane to, to keep himself upright. And uh, because of this clever answer, Oedipus was allowed to pass. But um, on the way to Thebes at a, this crossroads, he uh, gets into a conflict with a stranger and slays the man. And then upon arriving in Thebes, he is invited to marry the widowed queen, Jocasta, and, and thereby becomes the king of Thebes. So his, uh, it's kind of like his personal aspirations are being uh, realized, right? But in most versions of the story, the myth has a very tragic ending. Uh, the stranger that Oedipus met at the crossroads turns out to have, have been his father, and Jocasta is his mother. And when she finds out that her son's true identity, uh, what it is, she kills herself in shame. And the children born of their marriage similarly end in suicide. And when Oedipus discovers he has not only married his mother, but also killed his father, he gouges out his own eyes, ending his days in blindness. So we're going to uh, close the talk at this point with uh, a few questions for, for us all to consider. Um, the first is, um, how should we understand this myth of Oedipus, um, which seems to be help uh, directing us to try and understand the nature of the Sphinx? And, and, and so what is the nature of that guardian or gatekeeper of divine wisdom? If, if the road to Thebes is the road of a spiritual path, a true inner awakening of uh, compassion and wisdom in service to the whole, then what, what is the nature of the gatekeeper? Who, who does that represent uh, in our own experience? 
And, um, and then how should we understand Oedipus's fate? Um, he certainly had a clever answer, but did he actually so solve the enigma that was offered by the Sphinx? And then um, finally, why is it that all those who wish to take this path must solve a riddle in order to proceed? Uh, why is such importance given to a test or quiz like this? And why is it that one who gets it wrong is devoured? Um, if, if Oedipus only, so here's the final kicker. If Oedipus only answered part of the enigma, what might have been a higher or better answer uh, to have um, um, conveyed to the Sphinx? So uh, if you'd like, I can leave this up or I can stop the share at this point. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Kirk. Um, maybe if those of you who don't know how, uh, would like to know how to be able to see that and the rest of the people at the same time, uh, there's this little trick in Zoom. There's something that looks like the sliding handle of a, um, a window screen. And you can put your clicker on that sliding handle and push it to make the screen that Kirk has online smaller, and then uh, you can uh, choose side-by-side um, -side gallery view up in the upper right-hand corner in terms of your um, choices of how to see the screen. So that would allow you to see all of us and also the, the questions. Did that work for everybody? All righty. Uh, Wow. Did any of us know <laughs> any of that? My goodness. That was really something, Kirk. And so Oedipus is Greek or Roman? Can you remind us? Greek. He is Greek. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Although I think there was, uh, you know, the, the Romans inherited the Greek myths and traditions. So it probably has a Roman form. And, and it, uh, it, it's interesting because it occurs in different formats in the Greek tradition. It's told by Iliad in, in a slightly different way. It's told by Homer. Uh, it, it appears in um, the, the classic uh, Greek myths of Aeschylus and of other playwrights, ancient Greek playwrights. So, and it's slightly different in, depending on which version but uh, the way I describe it is the, the one I, that, that appears most frequently, although I gave a very abbreviated uh, version of it. And when he is faced with the stranger in the road, why does he slay the stranger? Is the stranger a threat? Well, they, they get into some kind of conflict, and I don't recall exactly what the nature of it is, but... Uh, like, um, yeah, I don't, I don't recall, but the, it's the, um, I, I, if, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, it has to do with like, who can go first. So right, they're at a cross, they meet at a crossroads, right? And they're obviously, they have, uh, I think, uh, there's a, uh, in one, one of them is on horseback. I'm not sure now. I don't remember the details. But, um, and so it's a, it's sort of like a um, inadvertent and sort of uh, trivial reason that they get into a conflict, but it escalates into a, a fight. Okay, so if the Another, stranger I'm... is actually um, Oedipus's father, he would have been older obviously older yeah. yes and so there would have been reason for oedipus to defer to him as the elder one would think in a traditional culture yeah right another aspect is that um odysseus or oedipus is considered especially by himself to be one of the wisest of the greeks and so 
there's a bit of ego and pride to Oedipus as well. And so, you know, as you say, he would have had every reason to defer, but he wasn't the kind of guy that deferred, you know. Uh, he was very confident, very uh, sort of aggressive in his way of walking the path. There's a, a Dawa saying, the meaning of the path is the walking of it. And this is a good example that Kirk gives of, of walking the path with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. And it didn't have to escalate that far, but you know, his personality, things did tend to escalate because he saw himself as the wisest person. Hmm. I think that's um that's that's brilliant. Um I think that that kind of uh in, to my mind anyway, um makes a lot of sense in relation to the myth. And the, you know, also the the cleverness with which he addressed the question, right? So he had a he had a almost like the you know genius level intellect, but that um um, you know, as we know, just intellectual knowledge, even at a very high level, even, you know, high scientific level, is not the same as spiritual knowledge, right? And and doesn't necessarily confer true wisdom uh, uh, upon a person to have that, that level, that degree of intellect. In fact, it can be a block as well. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, I've been all week long uh, really making use of Sharana's um, description last week at GEMS of, um, of wisdom. Mm. And when we were talking about the wisdom of Solomon, and uh, she was saying that wisdom has to do with the ability to take all of one's learning and experience and to put it into uh, practice in, in daily life. I thought mm -hmm. that was such an insightful um, way of describing wisdom. And um, so that would certainly apply in this case if uh, Oedipus or Odysseus had this um, this kind of mind that could figure out, uh, you know, uh, kind of metaphorical riddle, or at least at one level, figure it out. Um, but he didn't have the um, the wisdom to know how to defer um, at the right point in time and and to allow this little chance, you know, meeting at a crossroads to turn into an occasion to kill some another human being, for heaven's sakes. That doesn't yeah. seem well. Everything is everything is symbolic, right? Everything is allegorical. You can be sure of that. Yes. And and so um, one another way, maybe another level uh, to look at it is that um, what what kind of wisdom would a would a person have if they didn't acknowledge their um, the gifts and the the guidance of those who prece preceded them, right? Um, we just heard uh, earlier today, we were listening to a very uh, brilliant talk um, at the Institute of World Culture in Santa Barbara given by a young man who was just going through uh, his PhD in, in astrophysics. And uh, he started his talk, which was... Uh, really very, very well done. It was like my whole intelligent level, I felt like was <laughs> extended because of it. Um, he, he started off by talking about his teachers, you know, and the people that made it possible, that gave him encouragement as, as an eighth grader, as a high schooler, and played critical roles for him in, in guiding him and, you know, helping him to gain confidence that it was something he could do. And also being there as uh, um, uh, kind of mentors and tutors along the way, and so that the the, the killing of the father, I think, is is uh, you know you could even take it to a deeper extent, like uh, um, denying um, that that denying our teacher, 
denying our predecessor um, or even denying the the divine in us, right? It's, it's such a, um, uh, could it be that it, it has to do with the, the whole problem of egotism, right? That we think we're, <laughs> we're the center of the cosmos, right? And um, so, um, and then the marrying of the mother, I think also has a, has a, a deep symbolic value, it seems to me, that, um, and, and in many traditions, you have the female or the mother being associated with matter, and um, that is being identifying with the physical or or merely material, material wealth, material well-being, um, as being um, as kind of our, our 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 goal in life, our aim in life, right? Um, that that's also an indication of um, sort of a spiritual poverty in a way. So I was hoping you guys would help me with this question rather than me giving you the answer. This is just one way to look at it. And I think that, you know, one of the things that Blavatsky points out again and again is that all of these myths have layers of meaning to them. It's There's not one interpretation. There's at least seven, she says, in every, every uh, great uh, symbol like this seven levels and and apply to actual sciences you know if we really understood what was being discussed we would see that it has a critical there's a critical message there yeah mary thank you kirk um my first impression basically has nothing to do with these questions but okay. just the fact that our Mankind has had brains and has wisdom and has knowledge forever, forever and ever. And the fact that it's passed down to us in our present day and that you said that it was kept by the, the learned people, it was not shared among the, the regular, you know, populace, mm -hmm. just shows how far we've come. And I am not a cerebral type of person, but I just am happy to hear others who are learned, who can, uh, you know, explain this is this, 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 this. And I'm going, okay, you know, I, I get it or I don't get it, but it's okay. I don't have to know everything. We're never going to know everything about everything. But I'm just so happy to be part of this group. So thank you, Renee. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, all of you, because you've all shared so much from each of our different walks of life. And that, to me, is, is the joy. That's the gem of these sessions. So thank you all. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Um, Let's see. It looks as though um, David's giving us a little clue in uh, matter and mater, and that's a mother. Is that correct? I, that's I have, what I'm curious about. I have trouble um, tracking chat chats at the same time as uh, looking at people on screens. I, I'm not as multi talented, but I think that's what I saw you were sharing. Yeah, you do. You want to? Um, well, M A T E R. What is what is that, David? Alma mater. The alma mater is the is that beloved mother. Yeah, beloved mother. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I I think there the, those those terms do have common roots and common origins and um, and not not necessarily always in a negative sense right because we we uh we live in a material world and and the earth is our mother as well right and that um it, it, um in um in ancient traditions you get this idea that uh you know this um if you think of the the, the divine mother and the divine father as being spirit and matter 
which are both <clears throat> necessary in their union for, for manifestation, for the cosmos to come into being. So they're both, and, and they're, they're unitary in origin. That's the other thing that you get in, um, in many ancient systems, this idea of a, it's, a, it's triadic, like the, like the um, Christian trinity, um, that, um, that spirit and matter are really two aspects of one thing. So ultimately there's that union. But as we, um, at, at our level of consciousness and of being, as human beings, we have, we have that issue, that polarity on our plane that has to be resolved. And it seems like this is also one of the key messages of the, of the Sphinx itself, that, um, that we're a composite, that human beings are a composite, that we have, we have physical vestures, we have um, um, bodies and um, in, um, that, that have uh, tremendous capacities to them. Um, but we, we also are rays of the divine spirit, immortal souls who um, are not subject to the body, who are not subject to birth and death, and who uh, in, in um, systems of reincarnation of which the Egyptian system most certainly was one, uh, and the ancient Greeks believed in that principle of reincarnation. That 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 um, that original quote that uh, was um, sent out to everyone in regards to this theme um, becomes uh, pertinent in that sense. That if the if we make the 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 lion our our uh, you could say our earthly nature the guide, uh, then the the god in us is um, defiled. But if we make the god in us the king. Uh, and the 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 animal or the physical in us, the servant of that king, then we become then we enter into wisdom. Uh, and the in the phrase of Mabel Collins, there we uh, we become capable of opening the golden gate, the way she puts it. So it's not necessarily the point I was trying to make was it's not necessarily you know associating the mother with matter as being evil. Um, but, um, just the, um, uh, you know, in its essence, of course, divine, just as, uh, a spirit is and unified in, in a common source. Did that make sense? <laughs> yes. Bob? Um. Yeah, I, I loved um, the way you presented the riddle. I've always heard it, what comes in on four legs, goes through life on two legs, and goes out on three legs. Uh, but you said, what is the unitary being that is one, four legs, three legs, and uh, two legs and three, uh, three legs? And to me, that, that relates to what you were just talking about in terms of both our physical nature and our spiritual nature of the God in us. Um, <clears throat> what is it that, you know, and, and Oedipus clearly just answers sequentially. When he says man, he just means that we come in this way, we go through life and we go out. A very kind of literal part yeah. of it. But if we're unitary, then we have to say, what is the child that walks the path with us every step of the way? In other words, as Jesus said, uh, you must come to me as a child. Well, what is that childlikeness or innocence or um, uh, unprejudiced nature that a child has? And that begins to really then that's, as Sharona said, that's a lifetime of, of interpreting things. And to go through life is to step after step, walk the path. Well, that's, again, something that has a physical side which we know the third step is coming on a cane. We're going to age. Old age and death are, are part of our walking the path. There is no one who is going to live forever uh, in this lifetime. 
you know, death is inevitable, as the Buddha said, and old age and suffering and, and sickness and all those things are there. How do we go through that? You know, in other words, how do we walk the path knowing that we are becoming <laughs> forgetful, old, sore neck, sore knees, all that stuff is is part of, of, of aging. And yet, you know, wisdom kind of goes through there. Um, so I'm I'm very impressed with that sense of how you take a riddle on the path. In other words, there are gates that if you go through them, uh, you come out the other side a little wiser because you've investigated it. Um, in Taoism, they say humankind emulates earth, emulates that which is alive, that which is in the earth. But the earth emulates the heaven. And that's the spiritual, the, the law, the dharma that goes on. And heaven emulates the Tao, which is truth. And truth emulates what spontaneously is, the stuff that just happens. Emulation is another way of talking about, I think, solving through wisdom, the walking of the path. Mm -hmm. And I was I looked up something with the, the Sphinx. I realized that there sometimes there's up to 10 riddles of the Sphinx. But the second riddle is kind of interesting, too. Uh, it says, um, a sister gave birth to her sister, who in turn gave birth to her. Who are they? <laughs> and it refers back to the Greek. Um, night and day are both feminine terms. And obviously day gives birth to night and night gives birth to day. And it, it keeps going with that. And there again, you could you could sort of say that's walking the path too. Night and day, night and day. Sadness, you know, day is everything is bright and clear. Night, we're maybe going through some difficulties and things. I mean, there's a lot of, as you say, metaphors, uh, meta metaphors and, and riddles within riddles in terms of how you walk through the day and night. Mm -hmm. But I really appreciate that sense of a riddle being intrinsic to walking the path. Yeah. Well, you know, while you're talking, uh, Bob, it reminded me of uh, the tradition of the koan in Zen mm -hmm. Buddhism, right? And what a, what a uh, critical role that plays in instruction, right? That yeah. um, and, um, and the answer it's like a uh, it, it's like an unsolvable in, in one sense it's an unsolvable question it can't be answered by mere intellect or, or right. cleverness right and uh, and so yeah. and in that in that quandary that of uh, uh, aspiration to understand it's like it it um, the uh, the normal uh, machinations or the normal uh, you could say um, captivity of the mind to uh, sort of a literal literal interpretation of things and a literal experience of things. So instead of just seeing things on their surface, having this a deeper uh, wisdom seems to be awakened through that process mm -hmm. of attempting to understand. Yeah. And it's, and it's kind of clear if you ask, well, why can't a koan ever be answered intellectually? Mm -hmm. Well, part of it is that intellectual answers are always dualistic and separate I from it. And so the answer to a koan will always inevitably be experiential. Mm. And if you don't experience, and the more you think about it, the more you're holding back that experience from ever ha happening. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of dynamic that's going on there, I think. And mm. there are many that are, that are almost like gates. There's one where a water buffalo puts his head through the door window and his big horns and his huge body, why can't his tail get through? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. Was uh, Oedipus aware of his, um, the fate that he was, some, that, the, that, that would happen to him in his life? No, you mean while it was unfolding? Yeah. No. Or did you mean before that? Was it was it predicted? Was it foreseen? It was foreseen according to the story, right? But did was he aware of it? 
Well, I think that that he would become king of Thebes. That was foreseen. But not that he would kill his father and marry his mother. Hmm. So that, that that's an interesting point, though, David. I, I I think he was he know he knew the prophecy, so he escaped his town, trying to run away from his destiny. That's right. And then on the way. He found his dad, which he didn't know it was his dad, and he killed him. That's and then he got married to, you know, the queen has a gift, but that was his mother. So the first thing I think about this story, because I kind of knew like just mm -hmm. that prophecy, is that it talks a lot about faith and destiny and how, and free will, right? Like he wanted to escape from it, but somehow in that escape, he fulfilled the prophecy. So mm -hmm. the first thing is like, yeah, we are limited human beings and we're very complex. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are things out of our control. Like we do have that free will, but that doesn't mean we're in control of everything. So I think it's just very ironic. The yeah. whole story, it's, it's so ironic. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sharoni. Thank you so much. That is part of the story. Yeah, he was trying to flee his fate which was foreseen uh, that he would kill his father and marry his mother. And in doing so, he, he ran towards it. <laughs> and in the play, the fates are, the, the chorus is the fates basically saying all that. Hmm. So it's, it's in his story, it's there. But as Sean said, he didn't know it, but he was running from it, which means, you know, he knew something. But it's interesting that the play was very much saying the fates uh, and muses are part of our life, and we have to kind of figure that out as we go along too. And probably, and the answer is probably not intellectual. <laughs> you know, you know, one of the um, <clears throat> one of the things that occurred to me <laughs> in regards to that to that question, I don't know if there's anything to it, uh, but it was just yesterday when I was thinking about the question of the Sphinx that the the pyramid is kind of a representation of of the question because it's it's unitary at the top uh it becomes dual and then triadic because each side is a triangle but its base is square so you have you have the one the the two if you think of the, the two sides of the of the um uh pyramid Oh, actually, it has four, but that's a kind of dualism as well. So I'm not sure exactly how the two fits in, but uh, that it is kind of that representation of one, three, and four at least. And in in the um, you know the in the Pythagorean tradition, that that decad is exactly that. It's a it's ten points in a triangle with with one point at the top, two following that, three on the third line, and four at the bottom. And the total making 10, which is uh, said to be kind of a diagram of, of both uh, the process of manifestation and of the path back to unity, right? So it's a kind of a archetype for the Greeks, ancient Greeks, it was like a divine archetype and applied to everything, um, all, all kinds of, uh, system, any kind of system um, it applied to. So uh, I, I was, uh, yeah. It occurred to me that that might be somehow connected with that. What, what might have been a better answer, <laughs> you know, that that everything is is descended from a unitary center, a one the one life which we are all participant. But it also means participant in the many. We have to, uh, and that there's a kind of geometric. Uh, or archetypal unfoldment that occurs, and therefore also an archetypal movement back. David. I hate to raise the question in the last two and a half minutes about extraterrestrials. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, and maybe that'll come up during the pyramid talk, but this idea of why, why was there the riddle? And I was thinking as it relates to this idea that perhaps there was a selection process by the extraterrestrials that were um, doing whatever it was they were doing to change the uh, genetics of the 
monkeys uh, that were inhabiting the planet at the time um, some sort of test for their capacity um, to under, understand the riddle as to who who would become the 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 kings once they left as was mentioned somewhere in the talk mm -hmm. yeah i i know that those there are those uh theorists who you know postulate uh the influence of extraterrestrials and um ancient uh, civilizations but i don't that that doesn't really make sense to me and and what you find in uh, uh, Blavatsky's writings is that that uh, humanity has been through that that civilization has a uh, a rhythm and a cycle to it, just like everything else in nature, and that we we think that our current modern civilization is at its high point and it has and has evolved from you know the low point of the cavemen and so on, but that's only because we don't see the other part of the cycle much more ancient civilizations and that you find described in um, both Hindu and Egyptian texts, um, uh, divine dynasties where the where enlightened beings were recognized and, and therefore uh, ruled and guided the people, but in an enlightened manner. And so you have these great flowerings of civilization that occurred that are now prehistory and the, the story of Atlantis, of course, which occurs in, in Plato, that, that there's also these uh, enormous cycles that, that change the actual um, geologic conditions of the earth. So that, and, and what's referred to as the rising and sinking of continents. Um, and some of that is becoming known to modern science in terms of plate tectonics, but that Atlantis was at one time a continent and a whole civilization, which, uh, now is submerged. Uh, so, and that's why we don't have, you know, um, recognizable uh, artifacts from it is because it's, it's buried below many layers of, of ocean silt. Um, but, but we do have, and that's, this is the interesting thing about um, the Egyptian tradition is there, there, and you find this in Peru, you find it actually in the megaliths of uh, Europe uh, and of um, England and Ireland, many places around the world where it's clear that uh, a kind of technology that's completely unknown to us today was being utilized to cut and fit these you know, 40, 50, 100 ton pieces of stone with with tremendous precision. And in some cases, like in Peru, there's actual hillsides where the, the, the cut has been like incised into a hillside. So you have this big uh, bedrock hillside and they've cut into it and created somehow a smooth back for the slab that they pulled out and then moved hundreds of miles to another location <laughs> and fit it exactly to other pieces of stone. And where you have irregular uh, joints that, that are now so tight, you can't even, you can't put a piece of paper through them. You know, so, so the, and, and there's many examples and I can share, I'll send it to uh, Renee. There are many examples in Egypt of temples like this. In fact, the, um, right next to the Sphinx is uh, one example. It's called the Valley, the Valley Temple. And it's much older than the pyramids. Um, and this kind of, uh, unknown technology of, of stone working. And in some cases, there's in one case, there's a, a stone that's curved in its shape and, and molded to the, the a, a curving stone that's next to it. And, and uh, you know, we, we just, we would, um, it would, if, it's incomprehensible how um, those, that, that kind of technology could have been known to you know, uh, Stone Age people, um, even with the tools that are known to have been used by the ancient, most ancient Egyptian traditions, which they had copper tools and they did have good work, work working skills, very uh, you know excellent um, and advanced, but not that could you know perform and move you know these giant uh, pieces of stone in that way. 
So the, the, but um, this kind of, all of this kind of gives credence to the idea that not only in Egypt, but in other parts of the world, there were advanced civilizations who, um, who had advanced technologies of a kind diff very different from that we know of today, with not machines probably like we think of them, but a capacity to uh, possibly to alter um, stone, to, to cut stone by some other means and to transport it, to lift it. And there's many legends about, um, um, you know, this uh, both in Egypt and in Peru about this capacity to suspend or, or elevate uh, stone structures through uh, the power of sound. And so I think there's, there's a lot of mysteries there that we simply don't, you know, um, have an, a way to understand them and put them in the context uh, of, um, you know, our current sort of, you know, Darwinian model of how culture, you know, progressed from this very primitive, you know, uh, monkey-like existence to where we are today. But that seems to be part of the riddle too. How do you walk through the path with that acceptance of mystery, of wonder, of not being able to know certain answers and going, well, that's okay. That surpasses my understanding at this point, but I'm still walking the path. And, and I appreciate that. I mean, life itself, you could go in, in that sense and say that, you know, I, as far as I know, there's no biological explanation of what life is. That's, that's a sort of, the, yeah, it's a, a miracle. Well, miracle like it, it, there is no explanation which science tries to give. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that you could say that of existence itself in terms of the astrophysicists. I mean, you know, part of, that's part of the human thing, too. We come in uh, with childlike wonder, but that childlike wonder is there when we're adult and old age will die without knowing many of those answers, including what happens after death. I mean, we can reason to it, but we've already seen that's not the best way of getting through a gate. Um, so accept it with wonder. <laughs> and I just want to add to that, that I think that's wonderful. I think it's amazing mm -hmm. that there is some mystery to life, right? Imagine if we got all the answers, right? That would be a little boring. I think the wonder of being a child is like, you're so <laughs> naive in a way and so innocent. So I think it's amazing to like talk about this and trying to figure it out, but somehow just get to the point where it's like we just accept the mystery and we go enjoy that mystery um well, that was very that was yeah that was one of the sayings of Aiken Roshi who started my zen path he said our task is not to make the make the mystery clear it's to clarify not to clarify the mystery but to make the mystery clear you know there it is the mystery <laughs> i can't clarify it but it's just clear to me what it is as you say yeah and yet it's it's worth still pondering and exploring and approaching from all these different angles it's so enriching to us and um perhaps for that reason um the i einstein said that the most incomprehensible thing is that the universe is comprehensible <laughs> well and our response on the path really does define who we are. I think we talked about Oedipus having some character flaws that allowed him to do some things that were pretty horrible, even in his own mind. In Buddhism, there's the six paths, and two of them are demons. Uh, one of them, demon, demonic things. And it's not that there are demons out there or that there are angels out there, but that we ourselves can be demons or animals or uh, spiritual beings. And if we're demons, well, even the Bible has some very, Joshua fit the battle of, of Jericho. The walls came tumbling down and they killed every man, woman, and child in Jericho. I mean, how do we read that nonviolently? I mean, that's, that's our walking of the path. We have to understand that. We have to come to grips with that. And some of those actions are, are not easy for us. But, you know, they say that greed, hatred, and ignorance are part of overcoming that and they give animal signs to it if 
if we're really greedy, we're like a pig. If we're really angry, we're like a, uh, um, I forget what it is, a, a snake, I think. <laughs> but, but basically, that's our animal nature, which is always there coming in on <clears throat> four legs. <laughs> so we have those little sides all the way through. Just, just one last reflection uh, that um, this whole idea of um, the question itself being the critical uh, experience in, in the attempt to gain wisdom. You know, they have the, in, in Delphi, uh, there mm -hmm. was three sayings over the, the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And one of them was, you know, know, know thyself, <laughs> right? <laughs> And uh, which is in itself a, a kind of quiz. It's a kind of puzzle because who can say that we know, we truly know ourselves. And the, the um, uh, just as a final point, the, uh, the great sage uh, Ramana Maharishi, he, he, he declared that, that the only question that was needed on the path was who am I? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that if we really dove into that and sustained the, a questioning spirit in relation to that question that that itself would he he described it, it was like um the stick that was stirring a, a pot uh and and by that continual churning that continual aspiration eventually the stick itself dissolves uh because it's in one sense it's unanswerable it it can't be it's not a it's not a question of, um, uh, it's sort of an in, simply an intellectual comprehension, right? As Bob is pointing out, yeah. And anyway, that seems to be connected with the this whole mystery of the Sphinx, that question well, you, for it, sustaining. Well, you mentioned the Delphic Oracle, Know Thyself, and Socrates was teaching in Athens, and one of his disciples went to the Delphic Oracle and asked a question. He said, is there anyone more intelligent than Socrates? And usually they gave very enigmatic answers. And in this case, it wasn't. They just said, no. Yeah. Socrates is the wisest man. He comes back to it. He says, hey, you're it. You're the wisest man. And Socrates said, well, that can't be. I don't know anything. He said, well, I guess that's it. You know, at least I know I don't know anything. And everybody I come across thinks they know. Yes. So I am the wisest because I know nothing. <laughs> that's a great point, Bob. <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> I love that story. Uh, so he yeah. spent all that quizzing that he was doing of others. He was trying to prove that he wasn't the wisest man, that there, <laughs> there had to be somebody out there that was wiser than him. There's no way that he was the wisest guy because he didn't know anything. <laughs> but there were all these he... sophists who said, I do have the answer. Come to me, pay the yeah. dues, and I'll tell you. Right. And he would then engage them in the famous Socratic dialogue. <laughs> Yeah. and show of that course, they didn't know <laughs> yeah but of course he did know a thing or two that, <laughs> that's for sure you know he was truly a sage yeah so well like you said he knew how to question <laughs> <laughs> his whole life was that's asking right. questions. platonic <laughs> questioning yeah yeah mm. anyway th so rather than a uh, vote of thanks i'm going to uh follow sharoni's uh, brilliant <laughs> um example from last week and thank you all for joining me in this conversation and helping me to unravel. I feel like I have a better understanding now of what the, the Sphinx was about than when I started. So thank you all so very much. And well, and thank you for your wonderful presentation. Those, those were masterfully given divisions of the topic. And so they really provided a wonderful context for our discussion. Thank yeah. you. Did. Yes, so true. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. That was wonderful too. I'm fascinated with like all that mythology. So thank you. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> well, um, I'd like to uh, look forward. Oh, David, did you want to make a comment too? No, just just saying. Uh, thank you, Kirk, and I look forward to hearing about the, the pyramids. <laughs> I did sign up for the pyramids too. So okay, I'm good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll get more into that whole ancient civilization question. Yeah. Nassim Haramain's work might be interesting uh, to look into on that. The, the who? Nassim Haramain. I'm not familiar with that. I'll, I'll send you a link. Okay.
And just a suggestion, I would love to hear about the eye from the Egyptian tra tradition. I was going to present on it, but I would love to hear um, if you have something to say about the eye. And the ankh, that thing they're <laughs> carrying around, that mysterious ankh, why the pharaohs are always carrying that thing around, whatever, what that's all about. I thought for sure that was going to come up as a question today, but instead no I gave you guys the questions. So, <laughs> well, we actually do have the eye as one of our um, topics this year, which is what uh, Sharoni is um, pointing to. Yeah, and, uh, the eye does appear at the peak of the pyramid on the U.S. dollar, um, which was designed by the. Um, the Freemasons um, that most of the founding fathers, almost all the founding fathers were Freemasons who were studying uh, some of the ancient Egyptian mysteries. My grandfather was a Freemason in Cuba. It was a very popular thing. Oh. Yeah. So maybe you should give a talk on the eye. But I have no idea. So I would love to see if you can bring all this stuff up. <laughs> oh, there's a lot. I, I bet. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll share the symbol article of the eye with you, Sharone. Hmm. You more than enough for a 20 minute talk. <laughs> <That'll> be good. <laughs> um, I want to uh, read two quotes to close. Um, First, I'd like to mention that, um, as I said at the beginning, Mary is going to be our presenter next week. Um, the theme is the um, first of a number of themes of the Buddhist paramitas, the, the Buddhist virtues. Um, and that is the virtue of dana or charity. Mary is going to approach the uh, virtue of charity from which tradition? I don't know if I've heard yet. The Catholic Christian tradition. I don't Catholic. know anything about Donna. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I know. I didn't know if you were going to choose Catholic or, or Christian. Well, the, the Catholics are the original Christians, so. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll, do, we'll say from the Catholic tradition. Very good. Okay. So um, this is the quote from the week, for the week from Carl Jung. Um, Primitive man, and I think that is referring within ourselves. There's an aspect of ourselves that's primitive. We talk about primitive, more primitive aspects of the brain, right? Primitive man must tame the animal in himself and make his make it his helpful companion. Civilized man must heal the animal in himself and make it his friend. And then from Hermes actually from the article on the Sphinx, I believe. The silent visage of the great Sphinx is etched in the attitude of the timeless watcher who waits, quote, through the ages for the coming of man who shall rend his earth wrought chains and achieve the destiny of his race. So that idea of the watcher, the observer, who's always, always, always watching us, left for us in regard to the Sphinx. Thank you all so much. And especially Kirk, that was magnificent. Hey. Thank you. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you all. <laughs> see, you, see you soon next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Renee. Great to see you. Great to see you too. I saw you have the 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 whole thing for the book on the ground on the floor. Everything that I um, dictated while I was on my sabbatical is printed out.